How's it, guys? How's everybody doing? Um, welcome to Encourage once again. It's an absolute privilege for me to bring the word to you guys today. Um, so yes, I've got the privilege of kicking off our new series of love. And after all, we are in the month of love. And tomorrow, in fact, is the day that the whole world celebrates and appreciates the ones that they love, or at least secretly love. Um, sometimes a crush or an infatuation, um, not necessarily always true love. But although this is the case, it's the one day where the expression or desire of love towards another person is actually characterized by an action and not only a feeling. Because, you see, love is a verb. It's not just a feeling, it is an action. Do you guys remember your first love. Maybe it was a crush, that love that absolutely wrecked you completely. For some, it may have been early on, um, preschool for early adopters, and others might have been a little bit later in life, maybe you're a teenager, but do you remember those feelings of the nerves and the butterflies, the sweaty palms? You see, as innocent as and naive as that seems, true love is something that we all have a deep-rooted desire to find. We all long not only to find true love, but to love another person and have a love and find a love that lasts, especially in a world today where so many marriages end up in divorce. It's very important for us to find a love that lasts and a true love. But how do we find it? Let's take a minute and just think about that. See, maybe it's not something that we find. Maybe it's something that we build. Something that we work at in order to sustain. And the Bible is full of these amazing illustrations and stories and metaphors. And, you know, if you spend time in the Word and you spend time with God, you start to read between the lines when you, spend, when, you, when you read the word and when God starts talking to you. And um, a lot of the times in these stories, you'll find fundamental life-giving insights. Let's take a look at one of these. Proverbs 30, 18 to 19. There are three things that amaze me. No, four things that I don't understand. How an eagle glides through the sky how a snake slithers on a rock, how a ship navigates the ocean, how a man loves a woman. So the writer here is looking at these things, and to be able to document the fact that these things amaze you and actually talk about it, you must truly be absolutely amazed and baffled at how this can happen or how this is possible. You see, God creates things with an intricate design and a purpose. And sometimes in our lives, we turn those things upside down or we misunderstand them and we misconstrue them. So let's take a look at the eagle. How does an eagle glide? Well, an eagle flaps its wings, then it catches wind, right? Then it positions its feathers to create lift and it effortlessly glides. Did you know that eagles only flap their wings two minutes for every hour? The rest of the time they glide, majestic, seamless, effortless, as opposed to a hardy dar which like aimlessly flaps trying to take flight. Ever feel like you're the hardy dar in a relationship? Always flapping? Why are you late? You said what? <laughs> Can you just do what I asked? Constant flapping. Working hard. I don't know. Get off my back. Just chill. Working so hard but not moving forward. We've all been there. So much work, so much flapping, no progress. Don't you wish you could glide? You see, eagles glide in the wind by navigating the invisible. And love is an invisible reality. 
Almost like gravity, we see and we feel the effects of it, but we can't tangibly bottle it. So the question I have for you is, how well do you navigate the invisible? You see, to navigate the invisible and to navigate love, there's no, there's no real playbook. It's not like when you learn to play a sport, there's a process of things that you need to learn in order to get to a certain place. Or when you learn to drive a car, there's certain things you need to do in order to propel the car forward. No. Love is different. But with God on our side and listening to his voice and understanding what he intended love to be, we do have a playbook. And we do have a manual. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 3 verse 16. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So guys, if you want to feel the wind, listen to God's voice. The wind of God is the spirit of God. And we actually have this word, his breath, at our fingertips. Breathe into the scriptures for us to actually navigate. And you see, when you intentionally spend time in God's word, he begins to speak to you. And you begin to adjust you begin to adjust your feathers. Why? Because it starts to change you and it starts to mold you. And it highlights the areas in your life that you should be working on. Don't hold on to anger. Be patient. Don't demand your own way. Be led by the wind and glide. See things differently. See, God corrects and he repositions us to the point of catching this wind to the point where we're actually gliding. Are you a glider? Or are you a flapper? You see, there's, there's four things that you need to pursue in being a flapper and to catch the wind, and to being a glider and to catch the wind. And that is find the wind, seek his breath, read his word, and trust his voice. Get great at those things, and you'll see in your relationships, and I'm not just talking about relationships, spousal relationships or boyfriend, girlfriend, I'm talking human relationships, you will start to glide. So another interesting thing about the eagle is that eagles love storms. They actually get excited and can anticipate a storm. And what they do is they intentionally move towards the storm while other birds will flee or take cover the eagle knows that the power of the wind is so intense in a storm that it actually elevates them above the storm. See, an eagle elevates in the storm. And we all face relational storms, fighting, arguing. Let's be honest, in the midst of these storms, the truth is that it was brewing inside from the start. And before it even manifests externally, it's already been brewing, it's already winding you up. So we can anticipate it. It's those moments when you think to yourself, oh, she's not going to say it. She's not. She said it. Well, he's, if he does that thing one more time, if he does it, I know how he's going to, if he does it well, he just did it. You see, it's those moments where you feel it raging inside of you, raging within, what we need to do is we need to crash into that and rise above it to the highest level, the highest level of love towards others. There's three levels of love that the Bible talks about. One is eros, which is, it says, I love you the way, I love the way you make me feel. That romantic love, the butterflies. I need to feel love. Then there's phileo. I love you, but only if you love me. And as long as you keep your end of the bargain, I'll keep my end of the bargain, and I'll put in what you put in. Happy days. You see, sadly, many of us are stuck here, and we never actually elevate to the highest level of love, the love that God intended for us. 
See, God's love is agape. I love you no matter what happens or what doesn't happen. No conditions. It's the love that God intended not only for you and to give you, but to give through you to others. And this is part of how we designed to show God's beauty and glory through our nature. And guys, let's be honest, there's nothing better than be loved by God through another person. Have you ever been down and out? Somebody comes by you and they uplift you and they they lift you up and they help you. That's God loving you through another person. So when that storm comes, and you're walking with agape already in your heart, you already have that conflict settled. It's already settled inside. You start exercising forgiveness and grace and kindness and gentleness. I love you regardless. And you can live in a love that overwhelms and elevates people. A love that influences and changes people. So, how do we then tangibly live this way? It's so difficult, but is there one thing that we can sort of hold on to, to to remember, to, to keep us grounded? Oh yes, that's humility. See, just like the snake is grounded, it has no legs, has no wings, yet, it slithers so gracefully and quickly and fluidly across the rock. We need to be grounded. Grounded in humility. And humility is not thinking less of yourself, guys. It's just thinking of yourself less. It's something that Jesus modeled so well. Philippians 2, 5 to 7. In your relationships with one another, Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not answer, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing but taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. See, Jesus made himself nothing, and in today's world, that is such a completely foreign concept. Because most people adopt the mindset of, just look after yourself, watch your back. It's you against the world. You see, Jesus was the exact opposite. He was everything. He was God. He is God. But yet, he made himself nothing. And it's surprising how much of an impact it has when you actually put yourself last and others first. You see, there's this power of the number zero, which it equates to nothing, and it is nothing, but it holds this incredible power because zero multiplied by any number has an influence on that number to be zero. Jesus zeroed in. He zeroes out to make himself the most powerful, influential person in the room. And if you want to live a meaningful life and have meaningful relationships, then guys, we need to zero out. That means you don't care what other people think, but you are a servant of all and you serve others. Yes, the taxi driver. Yes, your mother-in-law. You serve others, no matter what. Because we don't do things for ourselves, but for the good and the greater good of others. And you serve with your influence, your gifting, your talent, while being grounded in humility towards each other. And remember that it's not about you. But this is so difficult. It's so, so difficult. And the only way to do this is with self-control. 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. For the Spirit, of God, for the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power Love and self-discipline. See, God gave us power to love over and over and over and over. And what this does is it creates self-discipline. And we start learning how to exercise self-control. 
Yet in our relationships, we seldom have self-control. Those moments where you know that if you bring something up, or you say something, or you do something, you know it's going to hurt or upset the other person, and very, very quickly you find yourself in an argument. You see, what we do there is we act out of fear and self-preservation, which is actually the opposite of self-control, and we lack the courage to actually live, so we complain about life and complain about the life we're given. And then we lack the power to talk face to face with the people that actually hurt us. So then what we do is we talk to others about those people behind their backs so that we don't feel rejected. And what we start doing is we start crossing boundaries. And in marriages and in relationships, those boundaries get further and further apart and, and we start overstepping them. You see, self-control is honoring yourself and others despite your appetites and desires. Husbands, listen to me. Watch how you talk about your wives in the midst of your peers. Honor them. Wives, same to you. Honor others with your words and your actions. So guys, I think a fundamental thing and a fundamental key to having and experiencing true love the way that God intended it is instead of how we're used to doing it, starting from the bottom up, is starting from the top down. Start at agape. Work at building your relationships on this highest level of love as a starting point. See, because most of the time, we don't elevate from eros to phileo. And in many cases, we don't elevate from phileo to agape. We need to start with agape. And just like a ship navigates the ocean, we need to surround ourselves with people that have influence and have drive. See, in order for a ship to navigate, it needs a captain who leads a crew to a destination. Who is actually, the captain is actually serving the crew. So when you're building into something, find somebody or someone who has drive and vision and has a desire to serve other people. And then ask yourself, are they changing the world around them? Or are you their world? See, if there's no destination in mind, those waves are going to swallow you and you will drown. Find people who are influencing others for good. Ask yourself, who are you leading and how are they changing? So, this has been a short message, and in closing, just remember these things. Serve others and exercise love, the agape love, even towards those that you do not like. And when you do this, it will stretch your heart, and you'll begin to understand true love exactly when it matters. And what do we do? We catch the wind, we elevate above those storms, we stay grounded in humility, and we lead and partner with those that lead by serving others, wholeheartedly. It's actually quite simple. Just jump into agape. Jump into the love that God has for you. Jump in to the love that God intended us to have for each other. The love that God wants to use through you to have influence on other people's lives. And you can apply this to every relationship in your life. It doesn't have to be a spousal relationship or a partner relationship. It can be a business relationship. It can be work colleagues. It can be friendships. It can just be another person at the supermarket in the queue in front of you. Love them. Serve them. Listen to God's voice. Listen to what He's telling you. Rise above any storms and stop the storms from brewing inside of you. Stop them from manifesting externally. Hold your tongue. 
Forgive. Just serve and love others. And you might be sitting in your lounge today or sitting somewhere listening to this and watching this and you might say, well, you know what, I've been hurt very much in the past. I don't need love, don't want to love. And you haven't really experienced the love of God. You haven't experienced how God loves us and how God loves His children. And you're saying, I I wish I could. I wish I could experience this love that you're talking about. This agape love that I had no clue even existed. Had no clue that I was actually designed to carry that and to walk in that. I want to pray for you. Father, Lord, surround whoever it is, Lord, with your love. Let them feel a sense of peace, calmness. The hurt, Lord, let that hurt be driven out of their hearts by your immense, overwhelming love, Lord. Let them feel it. Let them understand it. Let them know that it's different to the love that they previously know. And it's different to the love that the world tells them is the norm. Let them feel your love, God. Let them feel you wrap your arms around them and hold them tight like they've never been held or they've never been loved before. And Lord, I pray then that their hearts will be stretched and our hearts will be molded. And we'll go out and show others that love. And they will go out and show others that love. And before they know it, the love that you have shown them, they have channeled through them to multiple people, Lord and lives will be changed. Thank you, God, for loving us regardless. Amen.